All right. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? So we still have some people joining and we will let everybody come on. Libby, if you want to come on screen with me, um, we can do these introductions together. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Museum of Arts and Design via Zoom and tonight's program with Indira Allegra and Mariana Valencia. I'll introduce the program a little bit with my colleague Libby and then bring on our incredible artists. First, the Museum of Arts and Design sits on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask that we take this moment before the program to acknowledge the, the Lenape community, the historic stewards of this land, children, adults, and elders in the past, very much in the present and in the future. And to begin, my name is Lydia Bronner, and I'm the Associate Curator of Public Programs here at the Museum of Arts and Design. Let's bring on Libby. Uh -huh. I think you can hear me, but I can hear I, you. Oh, here I come. Here I come. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I got you. <laughs> yes. Um, this wonderful technology we live in now. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. As Lydia mentioned, um, I'm the bomb rep tonight. We're so pleased to be co-hosting this amazing program with these two brilliant artists who have never met. So I'm so thrilled about that. Um, I'm the director of audience development and digital production at Bomb. And for those who don't know, just very briefly, Bomb has been around since 1981. We've been publishing artists com conversations between artists since then. We're actually coming up on our 40th anniversary. Just want to boast two things. We have a new podcast called Fuse. So find that on Apple Podcasts. It's really easy to find. It's only one that co that's called Fuse a Bomb Podcast. And we boast an archive of interviews and um, free to the public and online. And you can just find them on our website. And you can also subscribe to Bomb, which will come to your home four times a year at a very perfect price for you right now. Um, so do check that out. That's my housekeeping. Um, so we're excited. Thank you. Yes. So now for my housekeeping on behalf <laughs> of myself and our AV coordinator, Tito Durkaxomo, who is logged in behind the scenes and everyone else here at the museum, we are delighted that you will be spending part of the evening with us and delighted that we can still connect while the theater at MAD is closed one day to reopen. Our museum itself is now open to socially distanced visits. And if you'd like to know more about the museum, more about our offerings, if you'd like help signing up for our mailing list, or you want more information about membership, which if you've been to a physical program with me in the theater, you know I now say membership is really the engine that drives all the work that we're able to do programmatically, please shoot me an email and I'll put it in the chat to the right in a little bit. So for this program, I think, um, probably for everybody in the room, maybe we've all been thinking um, these days about connection and empathy. And I think that this program is a really natural outgrowth of that. And I couldn't be more delighted um, that these two artists have joined us. For some functional stuff, we're on the Zoom webinar feature. So your cameras and microphones are muted to fully spotlight the artists. We'll have a Q&A at the end and we encourage you to utilize the chat and the Q&A features at the bottom of the screen. If you can't use these, but you can raise your hand, um, just let me know and someone from BOM will help you out. If you have the option, please keep your Zoom on gallery view, which is up here in the right-hand corner and not on speaker mode so that you can see everybody side by side. And now um, we will introduce our artists. Great. Um, so for Mariana, Mariana Valencia is a New York-based choreographer and performer. Her work has been presented by Dance Space Project, Performance Space, the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, the Hirschhorn Museum, and the Museum of Art at Chicago and elsewhere. Valencia was represented in a 2019 Benny, uh, excuse me, I'm eating my words tonight, Whitney <laughs> Biennial. She is a contributor to BOM, which we're so proud to say. And in 2019, she published two books of performance texts entitled Album and Bouquet. So welcome. And then joining Mariana will be Indira Allegra. Allegra's work explores memorial as a genre and a vital part of the human experience. Allegra reimagines what a memorial can feel like and how it can function through the practices of sculpture, performance, and installation. The three practices here intertwined with sculpture at time initiating performances. Their work has been featured in exhibitions at the Museum of Arts and Design, the Arts Incubator mm -hmm. in Chicago, the Kohler Arts Center, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Center for Craft, Creativity and Design, Mills College Art Museum, the Museum of the African Diaspora, among others. They are the 
2019-2020 Burke Prize winner here at the museum, which is one of our very top honors, which is given to an exceptional US-based artist, 45 or under, whose highly accomplished work is conceptually rigorous, relevant, and pushes the boundaries of materials and creative processes. So to introduce our artists, we're gonna start by watching a little bit of video, which we'll queue up right now. And I'll see everybody towards the end of the program. I am on earth. You are red milk leaked across galaxies. I am watching your death from a moving platform. You are in retrograde traveling backward against the backdrop of the sky. My axis is tilted with why am I punished? The sun commanding my orbit into endless anniversaries of your passing through. You are a star, a luminous sphere of you or my mother, embraced by gravity anchored in darkness. Good morning, I'm Edna Schmidt reporting live from home. 
Today's broadcast is dedicated to you, our curious viewers. You've been writing in with all of your questions, your wonders, and your worries ever since we've been broadcasting from home. Your main question has been, how are we holding up? What have we been up to? What have our activities been? I thank you for asking and I'm happy to share with you. During my last month of social isolation, I've been living with my mother where I've helped her recover from an accident that she suffered some months ago. My time with my mother was spent cooking meals, helping her do chores around the house, and most importantly, helping her do her physical and occupational therapy exercises. Here are some clips from that. My mother is recovering from a broken wrist, fibula, hip, shoulder, ankle, and her two front teeth. So that's a little bit about me, but there have been other questions which we are happy to answer. Some of our curious viewers were wondering, who holds the camera as we report from home? Are we sleeping well at night? And the funniest one, what do you look like from the waist down? Well, my loyal viewers, I'm so happy to share with you that I'll be able to share what I look like from the waist down with you today. Now, this isn't typical behavior for our regular television studio setup, but as we televise from home, our new normal, I'm very happy to share with you what I look like from the waist down. This is what I look like from the waist down. Please tune in next time as we explore creative ways of storing those very necessary paper products around the house. It's a special segment that we're calling, Where Do I Put It? Where Does It Go? Until next time, I'm Edna Schmidt. Wash your hands, stay safe, and make eye contact whenever possible. Hello. There you go. Oh, my bad. Hi. Let's do this again. Hi. <laughs> Life. I'm making eye contact. Yeah. Okay. So it's like you look at the green dot. Yes. And does it, doesn't it feel like, okay, I'm looking at the green dot. Doesn't it feel like I'm making eye contact with you? Only the audience will know. Right. <laughs> but then I'm not getting any eye contact. So I'm like, you know, it's I'm like. Satisfying. Uh, it's not satisfying. It's, I mean, it's like, I guess it gives me some kind of feeling of like, my outlook is that like, I'm giving the possibility of someone receiving eye contact or like, you know, I'm, I'm bringing, I'm making the possibility there or whatever. I'm making it happen, yeah. but that, but that I'm not getting that. Cause you know, sometimes people are like over here. They're like, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So and your, then yeah. So What's your remedy for the incessant frontality of our lives at this moment? Lying on my back. Word. <laughs> but that's always kind of been my remedy. Okay. What's your remedy? I'll talk more about mine, but what's yours? I close my eyes. Mm. And, but in any position. Yeah, it doesn't matter because um, Interiority is a full body experience.
Yeah. And so there's like, this could be an option for the conversation wherein I could just talk to you in this way, um, but it would be like less engaging for the people who signed in. Mm -hmm. Um, But I really, because now I'm really hearing you. Yeah. And you know that thing that happens when you close your eyes and like the thing you last saw is like burned as like a negative image into the, I don't know what this, into your eyelid and I don't know, into your eye. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what's happening. So it's like, there's still like a little box, but it's not the same box. It's like the idea of light and a box. Yeah. Yeah, I think I find that interiority from being on the floor on my, with my back on the floor. Mm. I often wake up from it and I'm like, oh, I fell asleep. I go to sleep. Yeah. Um, so I could say that my break from being frontal life is going to sleep, but really it's lying down. And then that leads to, it's usually like my back is on a hardwood floor and then I elevate my legs. And then, and then it's time later. I'm like, I wake up. Yeah. 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 It's weird because I feel like we do so much work to bring all of our hemispheres together, you know, as part of the work. Um, But then here it's like, you know, the only way or the way in which I am accustomed to seeing myself then throughout the day is as a like a severed situation. Yeah. I've been take, I didn't know about my phone in ways that I have found out things about my phone in the last however many months since March. And cause I don't really care for it. I mean, you know, it's like, I like a landline. <laughs> I just, I don't really, it's like my phone is for a a really long time. My phone has been barely a camera because it can't hold any memory in it anymore. And then mostly it's just for phone calls. And I still am a dialer, especially for my root people, like my mom and my grandma. That's great. My partner. So I'm like that kind of, that's my phone. That's the function of my phone. And now the function of my phone is that I didn't know, but like it counts your steps. Oh. <laughs> and I've been like, it does. I mean, did you know that? Do you count your steps with your phone? No, but somehow I'm just like not surprised by yeah. the amount of information, which is like. Tracked by it. <laughs> yeah. So I always was like, oh, I'm, when, I, when I take time outside or like time away, I leave my phone and I go away. And for some reason, now that I know that there's a tracking on my phone, I don't love the tracking part, but I like the counting part. I, I used to, before I knew this, yeah. I used to say, if I walk for an hour, mm-hmm. that's great. And now I know how many like steps an hour gives and I'm like, whoa, you know, now it's like a numbers thing. So now I'm like, oh, wow. And it depends like what neighborhood I'm walking in. It's like you have climbed up X amount of stair stairs or whatever, or flights of stairs. And I'm like, really? But it's because like there's an incline or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I've been, I've been reaching to, towards my phone for that mm. because it's a way for me to, I don't know. I'm, I'm accumulating something. I'm not sure it's feeding anything, but it's just stuff to know. <laughs> Is it helping you map things? Like cartography is important to you. The what? Cartography? Yes. So is it like, is it a tool that you use when thinking about that or no? Yeah, well, I'm like, oh, because the way I measure distance is through landmarks or visually. And so I'm like, oh, so 5,000 steps gets me to that house with that bodega or something, you know. But so then I'm like, because that's how far I went that day. Yeah. Or, you know, 12,000 steps. I'm like, shit, what did I do? And I'm like, all oh, right, I went through Fort Green. I like went through the park and then I came back around and then, you know, so 
Yeah. I guess it does, it marks the, 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 the map. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. I appreciate in the, um, the clip that you shared. Yeah. These movements that your mom is doing. And um, we'll talk about it in one of the images that I'll share later, but I'm about to have a hysterectomy in November. Yeah. And so thinking a lot about choreographies of recovery, yeah. um, choreographies related to disability, choreographies related to aging, um, feel so important. Mm -hmm. So I just, I want to thank you for that. It's a generous mm -hmm. offering. Thank you. It's Thank you for offering your um, experience of what's upcoming for you. And also, you know, what I came to learn from the movements my mom taught me because she was doing them in the rehab establishment for three and a half months before she had, she insurance dropped her. And so she had to leave right at the time when all the cities closed down in March. So I moved to Chicago for that month and took care of her. And, and what I learned from her movements that helped her kind of create a map of her daily progress yeah. was incredible because it was at a similar time when everything was kind of like, I'm sorry, you had tech this this on Monday night, but now we don't have tech. Like now, you know, like my whole like cartography of the planned fake future that we all knew about, like was kind of shutting down like, oh, and then this one came down and then this one is underneath. And like, now this one's like over here, but then it's like, the, this one went so far to the future that it's really little and it used to be really big. And it really helped me, I don't know if recover is the word, cause I don't think there's recovery from it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it helped me process movement during a time when moving was difficult. Yeah. And it was like an internalized thing. It was kind of like closing your eyes. Like I was like, wow, I haven't moved this softly in so long, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like the, there's this other exercise that she does that's like this. And it's to strengthen her wrist because, and you have to do it on both sides because your body heals. You may or may not know this, but it informs that it's alive on both sides. And when one side is broken yeah. and unmovable for the time being, you do it on the good side or on the movable side yeah. until you're able to start doing the other one because something in that path lets you know that like you can still do it on the other side. Mm, 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 mm. Um, so when she shared with me her path of that recovery, kind of like, now I'm doing it like this, but I used to only be able to do it with the, with the hand that moves. And then eventually I was able to move my shoulder into my hand that didn't move for a really long time. So the things you learn. To seeing her in that process, impact how you imagine yourself working 40 years from now? Um, from now. Yeah. Not that that, not that your mom is like that old, but just yeah, yeah. thinking about like how you will perform as an elder. Totally. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to take it with how it goes, <laughs> whatever it is. Who knows? It makes me think that like we, there's always movement and that who gets to say what movement is or means, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not like I didn't think that before. Right, right, right. But um, yeah, it's a great example of seeing how far or like how age happens. So like my mom isn't necessarily at this moment physically right now because her body naturally went there. She was impacted by an accident that made this happen. 
So she had to relearn how to undo a lot of things. And so if I imagine, okay, that might also happen to any of us, or we might get to that point through many different shutdowns that the body gives mm -hmm. at different times in anyone's timeline. Yeah. And so, but it's always moving. You know? mm -hmm. Do you know what kind of like uh, process of um, recovery will, you'll have to undergo after your hysterectomy? Like you have to stay in bed or have a specific yes. diet or? I've never had one before. I, you, I think you only get one in life. <laughs> That's great. I mean, that is, that is true. I've never had one either. So I want to get it right. You know? Yeah, you want to. <laughs> um, I think that I will be spending a lot of time in bed, but actually laying on a wedge pillow. So, which came in the mail like a couple days ago. Yeah. So the more I talk about having a hysterectomy, the more I realize how many people in my life have already had one. Yeah. Um, yeah, like they're more common than mm -hmm. I realized anyway. And so a friend of mine had suggested that I get a wet pillow to make it easier to like roll out of bed. Um, so I imagine that a lot of my uh, recovery exercises will actually be like getting in and out of bed and lifting and lowering myself from chairs or the couch. So like level changes, I feel like will be uh, the primary part of my care plan, you know? Level changes. I mean, level changes happen all the time. It's like, it's just like a new feeling of level change. Like when you said, I've never had one before, that was like a complete level change of like, dialogue or whatever you know like a, it was like a complete different burst of energy because like we can know that as being like so true and so simply said like you you kind of only get one kind of like life you only get one life it at that you this time right, right this right. way <laughs> but i i feel like i live my life in doses mm. What's your, what was your last dose? Well, it's gonna end on November 3rd. That's when my surgery is. Shit. Hmm. It's what I'm voting for in 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I put my ballot in. I hope everyone who's here has voted already, but- um, I know. Yes. Everyone- Level change. I, no, yeah, level shift, there's level change. Look into the green dot. I hope that everybody who is here today has voted or was planning to vote. Sorry, you can't. Well, some people can already vote. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the regularly scheduled program. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, what, I'm sorry, what were you gonna? I don't know. I had other questions for you. I have some questions. Okay, shoot. That kind of like came up when I was seeing the videos that happened. Yeah. yeah. There was this one moment where I was like, ooh, I know what's in that cupboard or whatever it's called like that. That cabinet, like the showcase. Oh, oh. You, so, like you pulled something out of somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ooh, I know what those sticks are. It's copal incense. And then I was like, it's not. It really is not. Like, <laughs> I really thought it was that. And then when I saw that it was metal, are they pieces of looms? Yeah. Thread, are there needle? What are they called? Those are heddles. It's like a needle, but it's like a head. 
Uh, oh. Title. <laughs> I like that um, assessment of the situation. <laughs> it's like a needle with like a hole in the middle. Yes. So it goes. The thread goes. It actually goes this way. Mm. And the heddles are inserted into a part of the loom anatomy, which is called a harness, which moves up and down, which moves the threads up and down. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in the cabinets are uh, a series of different tools and um, portions of, or pieces of looms, um, you know, but sometimes the impulses surrounding weaving exceed the need to make cloth. Mm. And um, yes, I thought it would be fun to create more space for desire, or for my desire in the work and to be able to um, imagine what like a weaver cam session would look like or feel like mm. for like the three people who would be like into that. I don't know, maybe more. I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure some people are into that. <laughs> I No, I really am. <laughs> I'm like, uh, <laughs> should I tell you something? <laughs> I know we're meeting for the first time. But can I tell you with my eye contact what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no. But I do know some people who would be really in that, in who are in community with that. Mm. I'm not going to say who it is because it could be right here. <laughs> <laughs> There's some things I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> I appreciate the explicitly named yeah. territories which shall go uncharted. <laughs> yeah. cool. Wait, yeah. but are there we wait, I'm like now I'm like, I'm asking for a friend. Are there weaver cams? <laughs> cool. <laughs> so like okay this is like a this is um this is just like a question I don't I've never woven on a loom I've made certain textiles like from knitting or like I've sewn together or I've like um felted and stuff mm -hmm. like that but I'm not that familiar with looms though my people and the people I come from in Guatemala are very about loom. And I've always worn loom things. My, I learned that from my mother. She's always had a very extensive collection of indigenous wear. Mm -hmm. And um, that she actually started gathering during the civil war in Guatemala because people were, had to um, sell their heirlooms to make cash. So she was, she was this like student who would like buy them. And so since it's just to help them, but also to have the treasures that then now I hold in the closet um, and wear, which is, it's like humans make these things, you know, like it's like incredible what we can do yeah. if we try. Um, and so what is your experience with looms as actual object for you and like thing or mm -mm. being, it creates something? Yeah, it's a body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're co-performers. Uh -huh. They're co-conspirators. And we have contact with the body of the loom more. If you're weaving something, you're actually touching your tools and the loom more than you will touch the finished cloth itself. So that for me is the primary relationship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that the Body Warp series for me comes out of a place of wanting to um, see what other kinds of tensions mm -hmm. the loom can, um, yeah, 
yeah, articulate or work with the loom is a body built to hold tension. Right. It is about tension. I like, I like knew that, but like, I didn't know that in that same way. Mm -hmm. It definitely holds tension. It holds so much tension. Also like, oh, right. Like, like different practices of, of looms or um, maybe that's not the word, uh, different. Of weavings? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of like different techniques, like like the like the women who weave in Guatemala, the like it's like a sitting loom. Yeah. But then, you know, with like with colonization and everything, there 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 are very extensive loom structures, um bodies that create wider fabrics. And so I've seen those and those, I mean, it's like pretty big. They're still handmade and they're still small for what we like understand as like creating fabric. Like it, it's really, um, it's quite like a homemade operation, but it's still like a pretty, a lot bigger loom than a sit down. What are those called? What are they called? They're not sit down looms. No, no. I mean, it's, it's, um, you can call it whatever you want. It's yeah. A it's a floor loom. Floor loom, yeah. Yeah. And, but it is all about tension. That's how it holds together. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, in that, in the tradition I'm from, the most familiar with is like in witnessing. It's like, and it's cotton and that's so deep. Mm -hmm. Like cotton looms, cotton fabric, mm -hmm. cotton making, cotton everything. Um, yeah. So like you always knew that like a loom was your friend or <laughs> like, or like, or like you had like a t-shirt and you were like, how, how is this made? You know? And then you're like, oh, well, this is knit fabric, but what's a loom? <laughs> like what's woven? Yeah. No, the first time I saw a loom, I was terrified. Mm -hmm because it's, um, you know, I'm 5'5 five five if I sit up straight. And I just saw something that was like, kind of at my scale. And I'm like, Ugh, what is it? And it has like moving parts. And then you think it, you're gonna break it or it's gonna break you. And then you did something wrong. But then it's like, well, people have been doing this for thousands of years yeah <laughs> really kind of difficult to to f it up <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um, uh so i did not always know that the loom was my friend as you say but i always knew that writing was uh, mm. yeah like a, a kind of practice which created a feeling of um mm, like companionship for me to be able to to have something which feels so close to like that is inside of your your head or your your somatic experience but to put it down in such a way where it's still close to you but it's um yeah it's just outside yeah yeah and it's a nice um it's a nice boundary. I feel like the people who we're closest to in our lives, like I want them, or who I'm closest to in my life, I feel like I, I want them as close as the writing is to me on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, like that kind of like arm's length feels nice. Yeah. Not arm's length like, you know. Uh-huh, right, right, at reach, within reach. Yes, yes, totally. Yeah is good yeah do you think about your like i'm thinking about bouquet yeah and so we've established the objects hold tension um do you feel supported i mean you use lots of objects actually in your your works how do they support you like emotionally you know, it's like in bouquet, I was making them, 
I was having them us function as an ensemble together, mm -hmm. mainly because of my familiarity with all the objects, which is that they were mm -hmm. gifts from people I know mm -hmm. that live with me at my house. Okay. Now that's not clear in the performance. Did you see the video or did you, were you there live? I saw the video. Okay, so that, that wasn't like, that wasn't clear in the video, for example, because in the video experience, you don't get the program. But in the program, when you go to the performance, it says um, beaded pomegranate, a gift from, a gift to Mariana from Anna Beppes. Got it. A net, a gift from Guadalupe Rosales to Mariana, you know. So it's kind of like using this very like archaic, like gift to from like language and kind of like re-embodying it and being like, no, but like these are gestures of someone else yeah. giving it to another body who then finds enrichment from it in an ensemble of the everyday kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are like the things that live in my house, which is why they're not like props, they're like, um, they're really small, you know, they're like to scale. Okay, you're five, five, you're, you're tall to me, I'm five. Okay. I'm five straight up. One year I grew one inch, about six years ago, I grew one inch. I was 4'11 for my whole adult life. And then I started doing Alexander Technique. Yeah. And I suddenly I had a physical, finally, cause like I got health insurance or something. And then I like grew. I, I was shocked because I was like, oh my God, I've been 4'11 since I was 14. <laughs> Where have I been? Yeah. But anyway, so um, in Bouquet, the objects are um, my friends and we get to be in space together and people get to witness that relationship. In some other performances, it's kind of just like what I have and that's what I go with. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's stuff from my house and when it's not stuff from my house that I've had to outsource somehow by donation or something I have found them or encountered them in the process more towards like the tech part of the process not so much during in the development in the development I'm like there was a performance that I did this January where I had six crates two cinder blocks and a piece of glass to create a desk for Edna the newscaster. Yeah. yeah. But I never had those until the like three weeks before the show. But I had them in my mind. Okay. I had the glass at my house, but that's it. I didn't have the rest of the structure. But I was like, I'm going to build some desk, standing yeah. desk out of some objects. Hopefully there's six crates or whatever. And they need to be a specific level. So maybe I'm gonna have to do something. I didn't know they were gonna be cinder blocks, but eventually they became that because um, someone had extra and I took them, let, they let me use them. So then I would just rehearse with six. So then I would count the objects. So it's like six, eight, nine. And yeah. in rehearsal, I would move nine things from one side of the room to the other. And in my brain that was making the desk. So I was like embodying the thing without the thing. Yeah. Um, but still, they're too scale. They're not like oversized crates. Everything's like kind of dom um, domestic. Yeah. I mean, is there a relationship? I see a note around looking at images, but I'm going to ask this oh, 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 yeah. question really quick. Yeah. Is there a relationship between the, mm, the multitude? that you have performing with you on stage in the form of all these discrete objects and uh, populist forms of making. Like I'm thinking about the, the documentation of the cumbia, like the street cumbia dances. Is there a thread of connection between those two like strategies or am I like making that up? No, absolutely. My encounter with the Kumya dances only enforced in me my forever encounter with having to improvise with what is in front. And part of that is, so what happens in the Kumbia parties is that, you know, it's in the street. So like the street is a place where streetness happens. 
-hmm. But then suddenly when 700 people are in the know of going to the same part of the street, yeah. and some of those 700s also have music and sound systems to like make the party happen. And some yeah. of those other 700s are there because they wanna watch some of the other 700s dance. Yeah. It's a thing that happens out of literally nowhere if you aren't part of the 700s mm -hmm. because you're not in the know necessarily, but it yeah. doesn't mean you're not invited. Mm. So it's even better. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's even better than not knowing you didn't have something that could appear. So like something appears and you can encounter it. Something appears and you can make it help. You can help it appear. Yeah. And, and the point is arrival and participation and that consortium of things. I find that all of that comes together for me in the way that I make live work. When people sit in front of me, I'm like, and here's the party and you guys get to be the pedestrian. <laughs> Yeah. Be like the long hour pedestrian, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Wait, I didn't read this note. Where are we supposed to be looking? Um, in the chat. Uh, yes. Yes. I'm, I'm ready for images if the images yeah. are ready. Yes. Hmm. <clears throat> so are we oh are we speaking to these directly i think it's a choose your own adventure great okay so maybe we'll pass through Right. Level <laughs> 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 change. Right. <laughs> Oh yeah, I I don't even know what to say about that, except that is the view outside my window. Right. And when we were like, when this came up for us to like share our things of, I don't know what they're called, like colloquialisms or whatever, like every days, I was like, I really hope Indira shares that picture. Cause you shared it with us in an email thread once. So I've seen oh, this one. I, I did. I've seen this one before. And I was like, what? Um, I don't think I responded to that email at all. But I was like, shit, that's been like burned into my eyes mm -hmm. in its yeah. way. Yeah. 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 You go to the next one. Um, so much of Oakland is boarded up right now and remained boarded up like since the protest started uh -huh. so there's no real visual access to the interior of businesses at this time mm -hmm. anything like cvs walgreens the library ups fedex it doesn't matter um the coffee shop you used to go to you're not seeing inside this is what you're seeing um, Wait, but are they open? They are, but they, you wouldn't, there are no sort of like visual, exterior visual traces of openness. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then on the right is from the Walgreens um, in my neighborhood, um, which I think pretty much speaks for itself when you have to keep tied four and one under lock and key. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that, 
that says a lot. Also, Tide is expensive. And also, I didn't know there were so many Tides. I thought it was just the orange one and the yeah. free and gentle. <laughs> I didn't, I'm like, what is this lab, Febreze Tide? It's like, it's getting confusing. I thought Febreze was about something I different. But I also feel like adding Febreze on top of Tide, like- It's too is, much. It's so extra. It's extra. It's ex it's like the extra feeling of clean. Yeah. Tied up. T oh, tied up. Ooh. <gasps> tied. Tied that's tied up. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen tied tied up. Also, it, you know, as soon as there was quarantine in Chicago where I was taking care of my mom, all of the businesses in Chicago boarded up. Okay but not everywhere, mostly in the downtown area where downtown in Chicago means like it's nice, like fancy. It's like where like you can buy like Gucci and stuff. It's like oh. on Mich it's on Michigan Avenue okay. immediately. It's like immediately they board it up. That and places that sold wigs, hair product and oh and gym shoes everything else stayed open like with that what I mean by staying open is like without the boarding up but it I mean it's intense it's intense <laughs> and being born and raised in oh there's another one yes that's what oh, I'm dealing with right now shit Venn diagram choreographies yeah. Venn diagrams are important. Yes. Hence the hysterectomy on the third. Right. Damn. Yep. Did you draw this? I did. That's it. All right. If you guys wanted, this is Lydia um, sort of inserting herself into the conversation. I really enjoyed seeing those images. Um, we have some really juicy questions in the Q&A oh. that maybe you might want to look at. Um, or I can certainly give them to you too if you want. Oh, right. I don't know if I need to be like... Here, I'll read you one. How yeah, about just this? read them because I'm like, this is... Don't look. <laughs> I'm like, I'm I, very can't, I can't read. <laughs> don't look, don't read. Um, but if I think um, we can spend maybe the next 10 or 15 minutes talking mm -hmm. through some of these questions, which I think really bring together some of your practices really beautifully. Yeah. So I'm very interested in the idea of how movement as undoing, movement as healing, movement as physical therapy, looking to others' recovery and movement as to inform your own. What else influences your movement artistically in the world in the things that you encounter? I think my my position, like where I'm standing, influences my movement as much as all those other things in that list. And that is broad. That's like a broad answer to like a more specific question, like how am I influenced? But it's like where I'm standing and how I'm seeing, what I'm seeing or, you know, where I'm going, where I'm moving to, to, to witness something. Like those mules in Greece in my picture, it's like, they were there, but a lot of people like don't see them as like that. They see them as like the, the, the beings that move them up and down those stairs easily to get down to that trotteria downstairs, you know? But I'm like, damn, these mules are walking up and down these steps like every day. And they're beautiful. Um, and the landscape is so beautiful that like, you're like, it's hard to connote that it's cruel. Mm, mm, mm. Does that make sense? Cause it's like, oh, it's such a picture, but it's like, mm, what's really happening here is that these mules are being rushed down to bring some more people, some more tourists back up. Yeah. Um, 
So I think my position and making sure I'm have, I have my eyes, my senses, my feelings. Mm-mm-mm. How about for you? Um, I think it's a question uh, about where I am welcome and what is welcoming me. Because you can be welcome, but also still feel uncomfortable. Totally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can be striding toward discomfort, but welcome. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I think that, that questions of... Um, yeah, invitation and the presence of it is is what moves me around. I love that. If you'd like another juicy one, um, this is for both of you. I'd love to hear more about your respective research practices. What are your relationships to oral oral storytelling to queer histories? It's like funny that I even am like having like a pause about this because I'm like, it's, it should should seem so obvious why I like do the personal history part of my projects or of my research and work, but it's not so clear. I mean, it, I think it has to do with coming from immigrant people into this country place um, and having heard their histories orally again and again and again, there's no history that's written in a book that I can read about. So the preservation of it is having heard it and learning it and carrying it. Um, I think that was my first example of, I guess, storytelling. I didn't call it that. It was just like grandma talking, you know, about that time she crossed the border and a man, um, she was sitting in a park somewhere where she thought maybe was Texas or Southern California and she was really thirsty because she had just been dropped off from a bus that like left her there because like the coyote who brought her across the border was like just sit here until the next person comes and picks you up so she sat there and she was thirsty and a person was watering some plants in this plaza and offered her water and she said no because she was so afraid and she was so thirsty but it's like shit like that I'm like damn she was so thirsty. <laughs> like every time I'm like, oh, I need some water. I'm like, no, not as much as grandma did. And she said no. Because she was scared, you know? She was like, I barely just got here. I'm not about to get deported. So I think that, I think that kind of thing where it's like these, these histories or these stories have like held people's reality together, sense of self. And that's what's important to me. And I'm, uh, there's a lot of other reasons why I use storytelling and things like this. But I think if it weren't for that example set out for me by my mothers, then it, I don't think I would have been familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I feel like um, coming back to the uh, activity of writing, there's something that's very democratic about being able to, um, I mean, it's just so simple. It's very democratic to be able to tell your story in the way that you want, but I think in terms of um, how that happened for me, um, I grew up around a lot of storytelling which involved the repetition of, of um, trauma or traumatic instances. So if there was like a, traumatic instance that had occurred, um, the telling of, the retelling of that story, and those are always stories that were told over and over again, not just once, could sprout at any moment. So you yeah. keep your eggs in the moment, or like, you know, and then learning about an uncle who died in a terrible way. Or you could be like sitting in the passenger seat of the car 
while someone else is getting gas and then hearing about so-and-so's miscarriage. So there, I think for me, there was a sense that um, a narrative can pierce you at any moment in the same way that uh, we are all pierced by things which happen in our lives, right? You know, there's no like good timing for like a, a not cancer, cancer Venn diagram to happen. It just pierces me and I have to go get a hysterectomy, right? Like the timing is not for me to decide. And I think similarly, the way in which those stories were rehearsed in my household could happen whenever, you know? Um, washing the dishes in the morning before bed. So I definitely, I think, um, related to queerness, if that isn't already queer enough, I don't know. I know. It's a, right. I but think it's our, well, I mean, yeah, right. If that's already isn't queer enough, meaning that time should never be punctuated or accented. Who, who gets that? I don't know, because that's not my reality. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, yeah, that's the right way. It's just like- You're always being punctuated, punctured. Totally. Yeah. Or threaded, however you want to think about it. Threaded. What did I call it? Whole headed. Head <laughs> yeah, totally. he Heedle. What's it called? A heddle. Heddle. Right, and I was like, oh, right, that's, that's a hole in the middle needle. Yes. <laughs> a heddle. <laughs> <laughs> No, totally, yeah. All right, should we do one more and then we'll wrap up um, right around 8.45, I think. Um, there's still some great ones in the chat, but how about yeah. this one? And this one is for Dorothy and it starts as a question for you and Dara, but I think Mariana, it's for you too. Okay. So thank you for sharing your work with us. Grief is oftentimes associated with heaviness, but the work that you're showing today, which are body warp, um, watching you from a moving platform, it seems fluid and kinetic. Does an intrinsic, an intrinsic grief dictate the movements or is it more about being in a relationship with a specific site, an object or a presence? Hmm. I'm a relational person. And I have to work with objects and with the narrative of a space because I know my body can't hold all of it. Clearly has been holding too much already. Mm. And so when I feel like I have that kind of um, I mean, just even the presence of the space itself because space is not uh, neutral or empty. It's coming with its own resource. For me, I feel like it gives me something that I can lean into and yeah, that moves me around. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, can you talk about grief in your work? Yeah, I feel like um, living is dying. So I, <laughs> I, I'm like, you know, and I happen to have had a lot of encounters with close people who have passed yeah. on on to a different home. Yeah. And um, so I take it maybe, maybe I take gravity light lightly some people take gravity as gravity and i take gravity as living mm -hmm. and um that doesn't come from knowing that that's what living is it's from experiencing that that's what life is for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um in that respect i don't know i don't i'm like i'm expressing my thoughts through the 
through the nebulous idea of feeling clarity in front of me, but I don't necessarily deem it clear. And I don't really expect anyone to check in exactly to the neurons that I'm grappling with, but that there's something in the experience of gain and loss and moving through it that we all have. And so maybe some mention of it will feel like a connective tissue, yeah. hopefully because I'm speaking to both the dead and the living. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a communication. Yes. No, I, I feel really sensitive to the presence of unseen forces in my work as well. Yeah. And like every, every space already has a current in it. So you are always waiting in the water as it were. Mm -hmm. And so I think if there is a feeling of lightness, it is because I have decided to step into that yeah. current and move with that. I'm just moving with what is, what is in the space, which allows me to be light. Yeah. Anything else? I mean, that's just about all the time that we have, unfortunately. There's some other ones if you wanna check them out, I can send them to you over email, but I have to say this has been such a joy. This has really been the closest I've listened and the most that I have smiled all day. So thank you so much for, for bringing um, your work and yourselves to this program. This has been, I've been so enjoyed hearing and watching and listening to you connect. Um, so now, um, since we're just about out of time, which I'm sort of sorry about, I'm so sorry everybody, but thanks everybody for staying. I will bring on Libby and Libby will conclude and I think give both of you the last word. All right, so bye everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I was going to echo the same, similar sentiment. Um, I keep having people text me throughout this conversation and talking about the intimacy here. And I'll kind of go back to what I said at the beginning. This is the first time you guys are having this conversation. So there is, um, you know, you're going, you're going to, to a real place here. And I think that, boy, do we need more of that in this world. So thank you for sharing your practices with us. Thank you for sharing your words with us. Um, we're so proud to co-present with Matt. So thank you, Matt, again, holding up the Bomb Magazine for that subscription. So we'll drop that link in the chat. And um, just thank you. And um, be well and take care of yourselves. You thank you. Yeah. you. And dear, best of everything on the third. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Can we, can we go yes. out on a note? Because you have a beautiful singing voice. <gasps> Ooh, on yeah. a note yeah just a note just like yeah give me a tone and then i'll give you a tone and then we'll leave the meeting yes okay this is my first musical exit okay on zoom uh...